Moving horizon estimation is where we're going to take some measurements and update a model state or a parameter or multiple of those. We're going to have this example here that we generated in our last uh, number 15 example for Gecko. And this is a process simulation where this was our input U. We had our actual predicted, uh, which is the black line. And then we had our measurements, which are the red line or the red dots. And what we're going to do with this estimator now is, is if we just have the red dots, the measurements, and the input, we're going to try to reconstruct the state, which is the black line, and then also some unknown parameters that are going to get that black line as close as possible to the red dots in some squared error or absolute error sense. So we have the prior one that we downloaded. Again, if you want to go to that, just go to, uh, if you Google search AP Monitor uh, Gecko, you'll see that as one of the links. And here it is, the Gecko Python optimization with the 18 different examples. Okay, just with instructions on how to install Gecko and these uh, 18 examples if you want to follow along with this one it's going to be here number 16 for moving horizon estimation okay so um, what we're going to do is just run through this code i'll explain a little bit about the problem that we're setting up we have uh, here on the right we have our uh, differential equations so our differential uh, variable x we might have our input parameters or input uh, exogenous inputs that are described by P, and then Y would be the outputs, uh, the measured values. We might also have some inequality constraints as well. So those are the model equations. And then we have our objective function where our measured values are minimized with a sum of squared errors. This is just in matrix form with the weighting factor WM. Now you also uh, have a forgetting factor on prior model predictions. Okay, so we have a squared error with a sometimes a, a smaller weighting on that, uh, you know, on the smaller on on the prior model predictions. Okay, so that's our forgetting factor, and then we also have a penalty on changing the parameter values. So that can be a very small value, but it helps out for unobservable systems where uh, the, the data cannot estimate those parameters. So it's just going to keep that parameter at the original guess value. Okay, so let's run through this in Gecko. We're just going to set up this model. It's just going to be a first order model. First of all, import Gecko, NumPy, and matplotlib. And, and if you're in Jupyter, don't forget the percent matplotlib inline. We'll have our estimator model, which is just going to be m equals gecko. We'll have our p dot time. That is from our simulator up above. So don't forget to run this one first. The simulator is the p equals gecko. That's going to be our simulator model. And we're going to use some of the values from that to construct our estimator. Okay, we're going to set up first of all this blue dashed line right here on the right. That's our U value. And that also came from the, uh, the simulator, the U mes. We're going to have our gain value. Now this is the one that we're going to be guessing. The value is originally equal to 1, lower bound of 1, and upper bound of 3. And then we have a time constant that's originally equal to 5 and somewhere between 1 and 10. And then we have our variables, which are going to be x and y. Now I'm going to feed in the y measured values, just the red dots, into the estimator. And the x value can just be a state variable because we don't have any measurements for x. Our equations are just the first order linear system for x, and then an algebraic equation that links y and x by the gain. Now we had a couple options as well. We're going to run in I mode 5, which is moving horizon estimation mode. And then EV type uh, 1 is going to be uh, instead of the squared error form. If you change that to 2, it's going to use this squared error form right here. But if you have it at 1, 
uh, that's the default, um, you're going to use a sum of absolute errors, but it's formulated in a way that gives you continuous first and second derivatives. So, for example, if this is my measurement, and then I'm going to have a dead band, okay, around that measurement. So this is dead band divided by 2. Then this is the, if I describe this as the objective function versus, you know, where the model prediction is located. So each of the dots might be, you know, model prediction. And then I'm going to have a linear slope up from after the dead band. If that dead band is zero, then it just collapses into a sum of absolute values. Okay, and that would be our objective function right there. But with this dead band, what that does is as long as your model prediction is within the dead band, then you have zero penalty. And if it's outside that dead band, then it's going to have a linear penalty. So this might be desirable for a number of uh, cases, especially where you have outliers, noise, or drift. And it uh, seems to estimate a lot better. Um, and there's a paper that shows why that's the case. Okay, so uh, I'm going to continue on here. The status is 0, says the optimizer doesn't adjust the value. And if status equals 1, then the optimizer can adjust it. So our U value, this is our blue dashed line here. We don't want the optimizer to adjust that. That's going to be for like a model predictive controller where the input to our model is adjusted. Okay, but we are going to adjust the gain and the time constant. And then we'll also have the Y. Uh, this, the status actually doesn't matter in this case. It's just the F status, the feedback status. Okay, so we want to indicate that Y has a measurement associated with it. And so we change, uh, you know, U is feedback status 1, uh, K is feedback status is 0. We don't have a measurement for K or tau. And then Y has a feedback status of 1, meaning that it's measured and we're going to use it in our estimation. Okay, D max is another parameter. Uh, this is the maximum movement for each cycle of the estimator. So let's say you had the gain, we don't want it to move by more than two each cycle. And for tau, we might not want to move that by more than four. Okay, so this just helps stabilize the parameter values. And then we also have measurement gap. This is that dead band I was mentioning. And so we have a, a dead band for our Y measured values. So we don't want to try to overfit to the noise. And so we typically set that at about the uh, the noise band. Okay, and then we solve it. I'll say display equals false, and then we'll plot the results. Okay, our U value, our Y measured value, and then our Y value. And we'll also do the actual and the estimated. So the actual is going to be from the simulator, which is the P model. And then the M is from the estimator. And we'll put our legend on there as a final thing. So don't forget to run this one first. This is going to be the uh, this this one's going to be the simulator. So number 15 is going to be the simulator. It's going to produce some of those results, and then it'll also produce a plot for us at the end. And you can change uh, you know the process model order and give it some model mismatch if you'd like. Just n is equal to one right now, but you can set that equal to two or a higher value. And it's just going to regenerate uh, some of these values. You can also change the gain. Okay, uh, here is the estimator now. So when I run this, it's now going to take that uh, data from the simulator and then estimate the gain, the time constant, and the states for y. Okay, and if I come down, you can see that it was able to reconstruct those states. The output estimated is right on top of the y actual. Okay, and then uh, what typically happens with an estimator is that uh, we run it one cycle and then we wait a certain cycle time and then we get a new measurement. So I'm just going to write here on the right, maybe that's my new measurement that came in and then the last one at the end would drop off. Okay, and then we would take this data, okay, the new data set with minus the last one that dropped off and the new one that came in and then redo the estimation. 
Okay, and then after we do that, we might get another data point, okay? And we just keep going, dropping off ones from behind, okay? And adding more points in the future. And so this is why we call it moving horizon estimation. This is our time horizon right here, our time window over which we're solving. And in order to manage the large amount of data, these uh, end ones get dropped off of that horizon. So there's a certain amount of, of distance that you can see, kind of like if you were out on the ocean and the horizon that you might be able to see is you know, 10 or 14 miles. Um, you know, so this is how far back we can see. And we do that to be able to manage uh, you know, the amount of data that the estimator sees, especially in a Bayesian estimation sense where we are adding data continuously for a tracking a live process. Okay, so uh, this is a moving horizon estimation example. Uh, you know, we just showed one cycle of it. There's also a GUI that's available in Gecko. If when you're solving, you just set GUI equals true, then it will pop up a GUI and you'll be able to see as, the, as you solve each time, it'll update that web page and show you those plots in real time. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed this. The next example that we're going to be going through is model predictive control. So we had a simulator, an estimator, and then the final one will be a controller where we're going to take that same model and then we'll just set status for the U value to be equal to one and then it will optimize uh, the manipulated variable.